I'm Lisa Stone. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Parenting Aces. Well, I'm back from Indian Wells, and that means you get a bonus episode of the Parenting Aces podcast this week because I ran into my old friend Craig Signorelli, who was also out there to watch some tennis, and I pulled him aside and got to chat with him for almost an hour about his thoughts on what's happening in tennis, what's happening in coaching, and how we can improve as a tennis culture here in the U.S., using technology and all of the latest and greatest things that are out there to help our kids develop to their fullest potential. I had an amazing few days out there and saw, oh my gosh, some unbelievable matches. And thanks to my conversation with Craig, I actually watched a lot of the matches through a different lens. He gave me some things to look at and look for as I was sitting courtside, and it really made a difference in how I enjoyed the various matches that I got to attend while I was there. So I hope you learned something new from Craig and maybe take that information and watch your child through new eyes as he or she goes through the junior development pathway. In the meantime, please enjoy my conversation with Craig Signorelli. I'm here with Craig Signorelli at the BMP Paribas Open at Indian Wells. We are sitting in the interactive lounge watching matches galore on the big screen. Craig, thanks so much for chatting with us. <laughs> Hi, Lisa. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Sure. Well, my audience hadn't heard from you in a while. You've been kind of, I don't know, off the grid? Busy, and... traveling, yeah. I've uh, changed locations a couple times. Went from Los Angeles to Atlanta and now down to St. Petersburg. Uh, we are about two miles from WTA headquarters, nice. and in the, uh, I guess, stronghold of tennis in Florida between Saddlebrook and uh, IMG. Nice. So it's a good new spot. So, but we both had to come back to California to see each other. <laughs> exactly. Because, exactly. God forbid, we should meet up while you're in Atlanta. No, the, ten the tennis here is pretty good. It's a worthy cause. Um, yeah. Bought some unbelievable upsets this week. Uh, I've already seen probably four or five of the top seeds go down into mostly young kids, so... The that's, transition in tennis is happening. That's a good sign, right? Yeah, I think so. I think so, especially for the American kids doing really well. So as a coach, what do you take from that? How do you apply that? Um, I guess I kind of look at what kind of game the kids are playing. Um, is anything different than what was being taught 10 years ago? And then trying to project 5 to 10 years down the road. And so if I've got a 9 or 10-year-old kid, what does their game have to look like based on the evolution that we're seeing to this point? Um, I think we're seeing a lot more balls hit down the line these days. Mm -hmm. We're seeing offensive shots hit from what used to be defensive positions. So if a player is eight feet outside the sideline and we used to say hit it high cross court, now they're actually able to pull the trigger down the line and hit winners. Um, Why is that? Racket technology, string technology, uh, athletes are getting more and more physical, mm -hmm. uh, more flexible, stronger. Every aspect of the game is evolving. Yeah. Um, and I think with statistics coming into the game, you're starting to see players play outside of the statistics, meaning if I'm hitting 80% of the balls cross court and I know that my opponent knows that, I may go down the line a little bit more just to mess with the analytics. Okay. Um, so I, I think you're seeing evolution technology, evolution in physically, evolution digitally. Uh, and so projecting out 10 years from now, it's very appropriate that you and I are sitting in a virtual reality tent because that may be the way people train in the future. Well, interestingly, there is an actual virtual reality display in here where kids are putting on the virtual reality glasses and they're watching what's going on in Stadium One right now in real time. Yep. And it's pretty cool. So, yeah, yeah there's can, a lot going on. I can imagine someday someone's going to plug a... Uh, a game of Rafa's French Open victory into a ball machine, into a virtual reality machine, and you'll play against Rafa's French Open uh, with a Wii racket and walk off the court five hours later sweating and you haven't left your couch. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be interesting. That'd be kind of fun, actually. Um, but let's talk about specifics. So, so the stats are starting to come in. The technology is finally starting to come into tennis. And we're, as a sport, we're beginning to catch up with the rest of the world and what we can do from a technological standpoint. 
from a coach's perspective, because that's where you, that's your world is coaching. How do you use that technology with a player, let's say a developing junior, mm -hmm. and help them along the pathway? I mean, let's let's start at the very beginning and, yep. and go through the process. Yeah, well, I think there's some disagreement uh, as to what to develop first. Uh, some people say you work on technique. Some people say you work on tactics. I think there's a chord uh, from everybody that you work on the athlete. Mm -hmm. And a lot of attention is being paid these days to two, three, four, five-year-olds, uh, what we call the ABCs, ability, agility, balance, coordination, uh, multi-sport athletes until they're about nine or 10 years old, and then specialization starts as they get a little bit older into their 12, 13-year-old years. Mm -hmm. uh, but basically, you want these kids playing soccer, basketball, uh, Tennis, football, swimming, climbing trees, riding bikes, all the stuff that used to happen before we got these little digital things yeah. that, that work only our thumbs and our eyes. Yeah. Um, and so I think if, you, if you're a parent putting your kid in the game, I think a well-rounded human being who's diversified in different athletics is a great way to start. Mm -hmm. um, and then if the kid has an affinity for the sport, you know, at eight, nine, ten years old, you're starting to say, my child looks like they're leaning this way and they have a talent for the game. Um, then you start thinking about maybe competition and, and, and entering, whether it be the USTA or the ITF or um, whatever circuit you want to go into, as an intro toward professional tennis or toward collegiate tennis. Okay. Um, and at that point, you've probably got a one-on-one -on -one coach. Uh, you're probably still doing some clinics because you want the social environment for the kids. You want to be able to have fun. You want them to see older kids who are both their peers and their mentors. Right. Um, and so they have role models to emulate. And they can say, hey, I saw that shot. I want to learn that shot. Okay. And that's what drives the kid to get better. Um, and I think putting them in, in a combination of clinics and private lessons uh, and competition on the weekends, assuming they're ready emotionally for competition. I mean, you're going to have some kids... That's balling. a big assumption, right? Yeah, very much so. Some kids are going to ball their eyes out at nine years old, and you know, that may be a bad thing or a good thing. It's it, it probably good if they're upset and come back the next day and say, how do I get better and, and find a way to win? Mm -hmm. And probably bad if they say, I want to quit the game. Right. Um, and so... But, so, let, I mean, I want to stop you a second, yeah. because, so how do you know if a kid's ready for competition? I think that's a big issue, and I think, you know, now... Um, there's this whole conversation around, you know, kids being tapped for special camps and special training and special teams and opportunities, and that means they have to be playing tournaments and winning matches so that they get noticed to get tapped. And if you don't have your kid playing in tournaments, they're missing out. Yeah. Is that a disaster in terms of junior development? Or uh, I mean, I, I don't look at it as a junior development. Uh, when, I, when I look at whether they're being tapped by federations to play for federations and for grant money and things like that. I think that's very separate than junior development. Okay. The organization will provide opportunities like wild cards, like uh, bags and rackets and maybe grant money to allow you to go play some of the higher level tournaments. Mm -hmm. But that's a separate issue from what am I doing day by day on the court? Okay. And do I have a developmental plan that's five to seven years down the road that's going to help me get better? Right. And if I stay on that track and my coach has prepared things properly and I'm a good enough athlete, then the things like wild cards and grant money and rackets might come a little bit later in my career. And I may be watching my peers around me and say, why are they getting all that stuff? Well, there's this theory that says... Winning when you're 10 years old is very different than winning when you're 16 and 17 year old. Right. So winning when you're 10 is about consistency, keeping the ball in play, probably hitting the ball with a lot more safety. Learning to play a big time game when you're 16 and 17 probably means driving the ball, being more aggressive and making more mistakes. Okay. Knowing that long term, that's the more successful path. And so when you're a parent, you can say, I want to win when we're 10 to 11. And then that kid gets really good at that game. And then when they need to ramp it up and play more aggressive and attack, they may not trust it because it's going to cause some losses. Mm -hmm. So they're going to stick with what they know. They're going to be a really high-level 10- or 11-year-old. And then suddenly they can't evolve to play the big-time offensive game that they might need later on. The flip side to that is I might be losing at 9, 10, 11 years old. I might not get the grant money, the rankings, the national tournaments. But I'm on a developmental path that is looking long-term, that's going to get me into college, 
because I know the college scouts want aggressive attacking players. Professional tennis requires aggressive attacking tennis. And so I've got to kind of choose my path. And it, it's difficult because you see your 10-year-old friend succeeding and they're getting rewards and you say, maybe I should follow that path. But tennis, one of the great tennis lessons about, is about belief in yourself. And if you have belief in yourself and look toward the 18-year-old benchmark yeah. and you say, will I be ready at that point? I'm going to trust my plan, trust my coach, and believe in myself that I don't need to win now. I can win later, mm -hmm. which I think ties in perfectly with this generation's instant gratification mentality. Yeah. They want it now. They can Google it. They can Wikipedia it. Right. Instead, this is long-term thinking, and I think it's the parents who are going to have to drive that a little more because... This generation doesn't do that as much. Mm, Long-winded answer, sorry. No, it's good. But so, again, I, I want to go back to my original question, which is how do you know when your kid is emotionally ready for this competitive pathway? Because, yep. like you said, you can put them in a tournament nine, ten years old, and they come off the court bawling and yep. say, I, I'm done. Or they can come off the court bawling say, saying, I don't ever want that to happen again. I'm going to work Ten times as hard and make it make sure it doesn't happen again yeah I mean maybe maybe you don't have to enter into a tennis tournament to find your first competitive environment maybe it's run a race down the street mm -hmm. maybe it's play a game of horse with a basketball you know find out whether the emotional maturity is there for understanding wins and losses and start I introducing the lessons of you lost but there's a way to improve so you have a better chance to win mm -hmm. before you thrust them into the the giant sea of competition and say you're going to battle kids with sponsors and you've been taking lessons for eight years and right. you're a 10 year old and you're just getting into this um and so i think if it's a slow introduction but at some point when they do jump in and they say i'm going to compete yeah it's the responsibility of the parent and the coach to keep a tight eye on what's the kid's reaction mm -hmm. if the kid's screaming and ranting and crying and banging the racket because they just can't handle the the competition maybe pull them out for a little while they're not ready but if they're screaming, crying, ranting because they want to win and they're fighting and they come off saying, I'm going to go practice more, that may not be a bad thing. Right. So it's assessing the emotional maturity of your child, getting the coach's input, and then you got to test the waters at some point. Right, right. Okay, so you throw them in. They're, mm -hmm. Let's say you, know, you throw them in, they handle the competition, they want more, they come off the court wanting more. Then what? How do you keep them progressing forward? What are some specific, let's say, day by day, week by week, month by month things that we need to be doing as parents, but also expecting our coaches to be doing? Um, I think uh, there's a, a dangerous word in there, which is expect. Okay, sorry. But no, 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 no. It's, it's, <laughs> it's appropriate because it's used a lot, but it is a very dangerous word. Um, there comes a point in every kid's career where they... They go into tennis and they have fun. And they're enjoying competition and they're experiencing the social environment, the competitive environment. And it's just about athletics and participation and competing. And then there's one day in a kid's career and a parent's career where the, ex the parents have an expectation of return on investment. Mm -hmm. And suddenly the kid is now required to get the college scholarship or required to win so parents will keep paying for lessons or required to win so the parents will keep supporting the player in any way. Right. Um, and so, I lost your question. I apologize. But I... I well, we're just talking about the day by... Like, what are the specific things yeah. that have to happen developmentally? And, and by the way, that point you just made about mm -hmm. where there's that moment where things change. Mm -hmm. I, I want to just say, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. You know, if a parent is saying, we're going to support you in this journey that you say you want to be on, mm -hmm. I don't think it's a, a negative to have an expectation that the kid's going to continue to put the work in. And obviously, they're not going to win every single match, but I think there should and is usually an expectation of attitude and work ethic, commitment. I think those are very valid, and I agree with you. Too often what I see is those are tied into wins and losses. Mm -hmm. And my kid may be putting in the work and not have the talent that some of the players have. And so when the kid goes out and loses first round, one or two, three tournaments in a row, yeah. suddenly the parent says, my kid's not working hard enough. My kid's attitude is terrible because they're losing. And, and so, yes, I think you nailed it. If you can actually determine, is it a wins and losses that's determining my expectations? 
or the work ethic mm-hmm. and the character. But back to the question, which was a day by day, week by week, month by month. Yeah. Um, there are metrics that most federations around the country, around the world, have as to how many matches juniors should play when they're eight years old, ten years old, twelve years old, fourteen years old. Right. You can get them online. Uh, workout loads on the body. Uh, how much sprinting? How much cardio? How much agility and flexibility? There's mental work that kids can start at eight, nine, ten years old. Yeah. Uh, there's on-court time. There's a million different ways to train, and maybe the kid has 16 hours a week, 20 hours a week, 10 hours a week plus school. Yeah. And so, determining how you go along that develop- developmental pathway is going to be based on the individual kid, how quickly they've grown, what are their genetics, how far into puberty are they, um, how much they're competing, mm-hmm. are they creating training blocks six, seven times a year. Are they taking enough time off? Are they getting enough rest? Is the nutrition right? Yes, there's a million things that parents have to educate themselves on. Right. But if you are actually going to pursue the path of Division One scholarship or professional tennis, you must educate yourself on those things. I need to know nutrition. I need to know a strength conditioning coach. I need to have a private coach probably minimum once a week, mm-hmm. probably twice a week, uh, at least for those early stages. Later on, when they turn 14, 15, 16 years old, they're probably spending five days a week with their coach. Right. can get very expensive. Uh, they're going to need to be setting up hitting partners for themselves, and a lot of parents will go out and recruit college players to come in and hit with their 12 and 13 and 14 year olds because they want better competition. There's a, a million things that go along with it, and you can look on Facebook or yeah. <laughs> any social media. Uh, but network. do you have to do that? If you want, I mean, is that, is that the way it is now? I think it's become such a specialty sport that if someone's out there working 20 hours a week and they've got nutrition right and strength and conditioning right and hitting partners and playing the right schedule and getting the right rest, you are not going to be able to compete against them if you're not doing that stuff. Mm -hmm. So that is a very small portion of the tennis playing population. Right. And so if you want to go out and play recreational and get a decent national ranking and get into a, an okay school on scholarship or play tennis even not on scholarship in college, there's pathways to do that. Mm-hmm. You don't have to spend a fortune. You can put in 8 to 10 hours a week and work your tail off, and as long as it's quality, you're going to be okay. But if you're pursuing high-level Division One or the pro path, you're going to have to tick all the boxes mm-hmm. because there's just too many kids both domestically and internationally that are doing more with the better resources and more support and you will not be able to compete against them. That's a pretty harsh reality. Yep. Yep. So, you know, I, I have to just say it again and I, I've been saying this a lot lately, D3 tennis is looking more and more attractive for the majority of tennis kids coming up in the system here. It's a very small percentage that get Division One scholarships and you're competing now against the world. Right. And so, you know, what is it, 3%, 4% that go on to college scholarships? I think it's even smaller than yeah, that. It, yeah, it, it's a very tough road. Yeah. But that doesn't mean you can't have a great recreational experience, a great high school team experience, great team tennis experience, competition that f- forges character, and, and all the lessons that go along with battling failure and adversity and overcoming and successes and and then go play college tennis mm-hmm. and then get out in the professional world and go be part of a tennis club or travel around the world and, and tennis is a, a very business oriented game right um, you can either jump on the golf course or the tennis courts right and tennis going to keep your heart in better shape yeah <laughs> for sure <laughs> and probably a few less four letter words so i mean i th- i think again you know it's it's really important to understand that there are different pathways for junior development and what you and I are discussing today is that highest level. It's those kids that are have the talent and whose families have access to the financial resources to take them to the highest level. That doesn't mean that there aren't ways to play college tennis without doing that. Yep. You're just likely not going to play at that same level of college program and or play professional. And it's not to say it can't be done, it just makes it very, very unlikely for it to happen. Yeah. Venus and Serena played in, in the middle of LA against each other right. and got college guys to spar against, didn't play a lot of junior tournaments, didn't play a lot of nationals, 
didn't spend a fortune on their careers and had pretty good careers. Yeah. It can be done, but you have to be pretty special, pretty committed, and maybe even be a little bit lucky. Yeah. I mean, we had a kid in Atlanta recently who he went to Georgia Tech for three years. He decided to turn pro before his senior year, Chris Eubanks. Um, he's the same age as my kid, and Chris didn't play a lot of junior tournaments. But he had the opportunity to train with Donald Young from a pretty young age, traveled the world with Donald, and got to see what life was like on tour, and was really kind of through osmosis, you know, grooming himself to be ready to go out there. It's so, osmosis and I think a lot of hard work. Yeah. Well, I mean, for sure he was working hard too, yeah. but I mean, to be thrown out there and have the opportunity to be on tour with somebody yep. at a young age is... You can absorb a lot, yeah. for sure. And and I think that's what a lot of these successful tennis parents have done. They go out there and they watch and observe and learn as much as they possibly can. They talk to coaches and they don't take one person's word for it. They take 10 mm -hmm. and then kind of muddle through all the BS and then figure out what yeah. really worked for them Yeah. And, and then apply it to their own kid. And there's a lot of parents who will say, we have 10 different yeah. coaches. You know, it, it's tough because normally it's one voice mm -hmm. and everything gets filtered through one voice in that case it's the parent that's the one voice and you got 10 coaches who are specializing in different areas they all filter it through the parent and the parent becomes the voice of this player's development um, but like you said there are other paths right I mean, there's this game is a great game for a million different reasons and the high school route the team tennis route the the zonals route the I'm gonna go play with a friend mm -hmm. route and then the oh, do people do that? Of course, of course. <laughs> Not in the high competitive level. Uh, and, and I'm kidding. Yeah, but, but it's true. I mean, they, they it, at the recreational level, you tend to see more of that. Right. And then you go into a tennis club, and there's leagues and club championships and intramurals. And, sure. Uh, a lot of Division One schools have club tennis, which is also very competitive nationally. Mm -hmm. It's for the kids who didn't get the Division One scholarship but still want to compete and the national championships for club tennis is pretty high level stuff it's very high level yeah, stuff yeah, I mean I intense. know a lot of kids that have gone that route and it's not even necessarily that they didn't get the scholarships maybe they didn't want the scholarship exactly maybe exactly. they didn't want to commit at that level right you're going to be a, a doctor and you're going to go take biology classes exactly and, and have labs classes and have labs yeah you're yeah. probably not going to have the four hours a day to do the training right so, right yeah so Let's go back to kind of the basics, and step one of this whole process is finding the right coach for your kid. Mm -hmm. How do we do that? <laughs> I mean, I, it's the most frustrating process, and you know from working with my family, mm -hmm. um, the level of frustration we experienced with that. What are the questions? What are the signs? What, what, where are the, yeah. like, the angels from in the heavens singing yeah. down and saying, here's your coach? I, I, I've always made the analogy that it's kind of like finding an investment counselor. Mm -hmm. you know, you're going to go in and say, well, I assume this person has a lot of knowledge, but I have no idea if it's the right person for me. Yeah. Um, I, I think a lot of discussions and a couple trial periods on the court. Uh, but the, the questions they ask are looking at my player's genetics personality and and it's very difficult for a coach because they haven't seen the kid yet right but, but personality um, attitude on the court speed athletic overall athleticism create a developmental plan for me coach can you try try to tell me what you're gonna do over the next three months six months five years mm -hmm. do you buy into that as a parent does it sound right is the coach going, to, what's the communication that you want with the coach on a regular basis? Are you going to be at every lesson or are you going to drop your kid off? Do you expect the coach to be developing the player's character and to be the moral guide for this kid? Mm -hmm. Or do you just want the coach out there teaching tennis? Right. right? Because if a kid spends enough time with the coach, that coach tends to become a mentor. And oftentimes that coach is the person the kid's going to turn to when it comes to dating and drugs and homework and school and a million other things. Is that coach the role model you want for that kid? And this is for, for young girls and for young boys. Absolutely, I mean, because yep. you work with both. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. And and is the is the coach living a life that is going to be the model that you want your kid to be around? You know, they say that you are a compilation of the five people you spend the most time with. Right. Well, that coach is going to be one of those five people. Right. Is that the influence you want for your child? That's a huge point. Yep. And how do you find that out as a parent? I mean... Word of mouth is some of it. Yeah. Um, 
spending some time watching at the beginning. I mean, look, I love it when a parent drops the kid off and leaves. Yeah. It makes my life a lot easier um, because I don't have to filter everything through the parent to right. make sure that it's okay. But I do think as a parent, if I were to take my kid to a coach, I would spend the first five, six lessons watching. What's the language? Is it appropriate for that age? Uh, checking the background of the coach's education. Are they knowledgeable in tactics and strategy and technique and biomechanics and strength and conditioning? What is their specialty? Are they universally knowledgeable where they can take my kid and handle all the aspects of the training or is this a specialty thing? Mm -hmm. And even for a five and six year old, is there cursing going on? You know, are they, are they dumping the beer cans in the, in the thing before they jump on the court? Right. Yeah, you kind of got to watch. And is the court clean? Is it, you know, is every kid handled the same way? Watch a lesson after your kids. Watch a lesson before and find out are kids being treated the same? Are they being treated appropriately? Is it texting with the coach? Is it emailing? Is it phone calls? And how often are those happening? And I would say very early in the relationship, you need to establish what you need as a parent mm -hmm. and then let the coach decide if that's okay. Because as a coach, if a parent tells me I need a phone call every night and it's going to take 45 minutes, yeah. I'm probably not going to work with that kid. Okay. Just and I like how you said what you need, not what you expect. Yes. So you, you're yes. turning my language around a little bit. But <laughs> no, that's good because I think it's important for us to understand how to talk to you. You know, we assume that the language we use in other situations automatically crosses over and it doesn't always cross over. I guess I, I would say that as a parent, I'd like you to put yourself in my shoes, mm -hmm. knowing that I'm going to have about 35 to 50 kids in a clinic. I'm going to have five to six different students every day. So I may be working with 50 or 60 kids. Mm -hmm. And if every parent just wants five minutes, it's going to be after midnight before I'm finished returning phone calls. Right. Right? Um, and I, I need to be treating all of those kids with the attitude that I'm going to maximize every kid's potential that's here. Um, it's very easy for a coach to say, this is a high-level player, they're going to get more from me. Mm -hmm. Very easy. And maybe even be appropriate because it helps my business. Right. It helps my reputation. That kid probably needs more work because they have a, a better future than a lot of the recreational players. But it doesn't mean it's right for the rest of the kids. Right. And you have to decide as a parent, is that okay? Also knowing that there are benefits to your kid seeing that high-level kid. Because right. that kid becomes a mentor, that kid becomes the role model, that kid is what your kids are aspiring to. So it's a balance. Um, and I think if I were a coach asking, okay, okay. if I was a coach asking questions, or a parent asking questions, the things that I would be most interested in are, what's your communication method with me as a parent? Mm -hmm. What's your communication with my kid? You coach, what are your expectations of me and my child as we go along this path? Mm -hmm. What are the projected expenses over the next six months to five years? What is your long-term plan for my child? And what do we have to use as resources? Because if the coach says, I need you to get a strength coach and a mental coach, and then, okay, I need to know that up front. Mm -hmm. um, and coach, what is your background as far as having coached other players? Uh, how have they, what have their results been like? And that doesn't mean just wins and losses. But maybe they went on to, to Harvard and didn't play for the school. Mm -hmm. But there's 23 kids that went to Harvard University with great character and 4.5 GPAs and also played tennis along the way. Yeah. Maybe you hate that as a parent. Maybe you love it. But again, those are the questions that I would ask up front. And I think the way that what you just said about Harvard, mm -hmm. <laughs> the way that a coach answers that question is very telling, right? Because... To say that and to be proud as a coach that you've developed kids that went on to Harvard, even yeah. if they're not playing tennis, speaks to the character of that coach. Well, to the character, but it also speaks to the goals of that coach. Right. And, and you as a parent may say, I want my kid to play pro tennis. I don't want him going to a great university. Right. Right? Yes. And so knowing where that coach has come from and what the agenda is for those kids. Yeah. I think that has to be laid out up front yeah. and, and then a couple lessons and watch and look at the environment of the clinics and okay. look at the balls in the basket are they dead or are they new or yeah. are they somewhere in the middle you know there's yeah. a lot of little details let's talk a little bit about early development mm -hmm. um, and the whole red orange green thing and what are your thoughts on that now, be honest I mean um, I might I have <laughs> I have very clear thoughts on it that I've shared numerous times 
I, I have experimented with red, orange, green. I've experimented with just playing yellow ball. In my opinion, the ball doesn't determine the player's development. Okay. I think I think you can have a pro player hitting with a green ball mm-hmm. and get a great workout with consistency and having to hit through the ball bigger to create racket speed. And I think you can have a four-year-old hitting a yellow ball for that feel and her trying to drive through it more and and everything moves faster and the bounce is higher and you have to adapt. Mm-hmm. And so I don't have an opinion on whether one way is right or wrong. Okay. I do say that whatever tools are out there, find out if your coach is going to utilize all of them to help your kid get better. Okay. I would never tell a parent you have to go into that program because there's a red, orange, green Mm -hmm. or because they're not using it. Mm -hmm. I would just say observe, is the coach maximizing each student's ability and utilizing all the tools to their disposal to get your kid as good as they can be as fast as they can be. Okay. So. Is that politically correct uh enough? Uh-huh. Yeah. (laughs) Mm Mm-hmm. So let's say you have this Mm eight-year-old who's ready to to start competing Mm -hmm. And where you live dictates that that kid has to start on the red ball if okay. they want to play tournaments. Okay. You're good with that as a coach, or how do you handle that as a coach? I don't love it. I think I think if I was in school reading books, and I was a great reader mm-hmm. in third grade, and the other kids were reading Dr. Seuss and I'm reading Harry Potter, mm-hmm. um, I think I should be allowed to read Harry Potter and advance as quickly as I possibly can. I may be um, that point one percent. Right. That can advance quicker than everybody else, and I think it's detrimental to those kids who are in that elite group. However, the federation has determined that we're going to create a platform for 99.9 percent of the kids mm-hmm. in the country, and I can't fault them for that. Mm-hmm. And so, they have a template, and I would tell my kid, "Go compete, go ahead and dominate. It's okay." And then the minute you come, and, and that's simply for the tournament experience. Mm-hmm. Maybe you give your kids some, some rules in the tournament. You can only hit slice backhands. You must serve in volley. You're going to do some things that you might not do uh, at your skill level yet, but you can do it on the red ball court. Okay. So it's going to advance your tactical skills and strategic skills, mm-hmm. but may not necessarily be best for your technique. Okay? okay. So then I would say, okay, you've played your competition, you've gotten some of that experience, you understand winning and losing, let's get back to whatever ball we use for training, mm-hmm. and we'll work on that. And then if you win enough tournaments, you get to move up anyway, right? Yeah. So I think you can utilize the templates that, that's there. Utilize what the USDA has set up as um, a format for all the different ages mm-hmm. and maximize your potential using their systems. Okay. And have someone driving that developmental process that says, this is how we're going to do it. We're not necessarily going to follow the path of the Federation. We're going to use what they've provided as resources under my tutelage. How many coaches do you think do that? Um, not a lot, but the ones who do it are generally the ones who are working with the .1 percenters. Yeah. They've kind of figured out, we have to do this, and there's not a lot of coaches who do that. Mm-hmm. So, But I think those coaches have educated themselves and said, we have to work within the system. How do we do it best? Mm-hmm. And those coaches are working with elite players and at an elite level because they've been able to figure that stuff out through their careers. And are these things that you coaches discuss when y'all are at conferences? I mean, do y'all talk about, okay, we're, we have this red, orange, green thing happening. We, we're, how, do we, how do we manage that with our, our elite we players? We talk about them at conferences, not in conferences. Uh, uh, yes. no, no, but uh, honestly, yeah. in conference, it's very much... Um, Party line. Not, not just party line, but it's it's more education, um, kind of kind of overview of, of the tennis landscape, okay, and making ourselves more educated about what's happening, uh-huh. and then you go sit down for lunch and the talk about okay, now we have all the information. How do we navigate it with whatever the population players we're working with? Okay, so. So yes, y'all are collaborating and having those conversations yes. amongst yourselves. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and we try to. I guess we don't put it out to the parental community, mm-hmm. but we probably work individually with the parents that we work with and, right. and their kids. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I that's good to know. Yeah. Like that, those conversations are happening. Definitely. Because I had one today. <laughs> okay. Good. Yeah. Good. Um, all right. Well, let's jump to technology a little bit, mm-hmm. and we touched on that at the beginning. That tennis is starting to catch up, and in the technology arena, 
as a coach, what sort of technology are you using with your players, and what are the minimums that parents should be looking at, or is there a minimum? I mean, no. should we have an ex? I, I gotta get away from that expectation word. <laughs> should we ask the question about technology and you know? Let me tell you where the game's going. Okay. Um, we are. We went into the video world a few years ago. Everybody's mm -hmm. got cell phones. We, we started videoing players, right. let's say, 10, 15 years ago. And we started doing visual analysis of strokes and biomechanics and, and starting to follow patterns on the court with mm -hmm. the camera. Mm -hmm. Then every kid got a camera on their phone. Right. And now they're taking selfies and, and you can hold the camera up five feet away and video a player's strokes and show them in slow motion five seconds later. Right. Fantastic. So we have the visual analysis, which allows our technical prowess to be great okay. and to really model what the pros are doing and to find any flaws. Okay. Uh, now we need to know tactically how to play. And what's informing that is the analytics. Mm -hmm. And the analytics are coming from SAP with the WTA and IBM with the ATP. And those organizations are putting tremendous amounts of data into the hands of coaches mm -hmm. via reports, via the USTA, via um, Craig O'Shaughnessy, is a coach from Australia, yep. has something called the Brain Game. Uh, Craig's done the podcast. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah so, so there, he talked about that. Yeah. tons of data out there mm -hmm. that's saying what's happening on the court. And now parents are able to pay for um, analytics of their own child's matches and their opponent's matches and work with their coach on figuring out what are the tactics we need today to beat this player. Okay. I think as time goes by, the price of that is going to get less and less. It's still pretty expensive because it's relatively new to the sport, mm -hmm. and they don't really do it in junior tennis unless the premium is extremely high. Right. Um, but I think it'll drop down the way video technology dropped down in price. Mm -hmm. It'll become economically feasible to... Um, maybe even do it yourself. You can have an app in your phone mm -hmm. where you shoot the match, the analytics come up, and they say, boy, your player's getting beat a lot on the wide serve. You need to cover that more. Or you're winning more points when you're on the baseline and losing more when you're eight feet behind the baseline, or vice versa. Mm -hmm. And a parent can kind of figure that information out. A coach will definitely be able to figure that information out. And there should be, you know, those little coaching breaks in the middle of matches where that coach gets to input that information. Mm -hmm. um, Having said that, even with all of the analytics, most of it is going to be applied in practice. Okay. Because in the matches, you're going to tell your player, you need to figure it out. You're in the heat of battle. You need to start looking for how am I winning my points, how am I losing my points. Based on all of the things we've practiced and knowing what analytics we look at, mm -hmm. during your match, you're going to have to be thinking both about yourself internally and externally about your opponent and figure out what's happening some some analytics as you play on the fly uh, and then afterward you'll be able to look at the actual data and figure out did I get it right mm -hmm. and so I think that's the future but see I love that approach I love that Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome well you know how I feel about your coaching um, I, I love the fact that you say we use the data and the analytics during practice so that the player gets used to the language yep. the you know immediacy of it we just played this point now let's look at it what'd you do right what'd you do wrong tell me quick 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 yep. and then once they're in a, a tournament situation a mat a, a competitive match situation it's hands off from the coach and did the player absorb what he or she's been learning in practice it's like learning a language and then you go into the country yeah and suddenly you can't fake it anymore. <laughs> you can't speak whatever your native language is. You're thrust into it. It's an immersive environment. Yep. And you have to navigate it. And you're going to make a few mistakes. And then over time, you're going to become fluent. And I think that's the goal, to become a fluent tennis player mm -hmm. who can do all the things that they want to do and then also look on the other side of the court and say, I understand this interaction and how to figure out the strengths and weaknesses on the other side. So I have a question for you. Okay. Let's... You know, face it. For for most kids, when they go to tournaments, it's a parent taking them to the tournament, unless the family's got enough money to afford to send the coach. So typically, the parents are giving a report back to the coach on Monday or Tuesday after the tournament. Here's what my kid did well. Here's what they didn't do well. Now that we're starting to look at analytics and talk about using analytics, if I'm on the sideline watching my child play, how do I? What do I look for in order to communicate back to you as a coach that my child is self-analyzing well or 
is um, here, still here, lacking there. Let me answer that in several parts. Okay. Number one, you said you've been doing that and going back to the coach and telling him things. Mm-hmm. We as coaches, um, I'm going to say something that's probably going to get me in trouble as a coach and so, what else apologize is new? for the coaching community. Uh, we as coaches are very wary of that okay. because you are completely invested in the both the development and the winning from your child. Okay. There are things that are happening on the court where you will see it one way, your child will see it another, and the coaches will see it completely the opposite. Uh huh. So we will listen to what you say. We won't necessarily trust it. <laughs> we will listen to what the what? player. We will listen to what the player says. We won't necessarily trust it. Okay. Um, but we're going to look at how the information you gave us fits into the developmental plan okay. for the player. And so the best thing you can do is video the match. Okay. Because then we can hear what you said and go watch it and see if that matches up. And we can decide, are you a parent who's actually getting the right information? Mm-hmm. And then we can start trusting you more and more with it. Okay. But we have parents who've never played tennis. Right. Who come to us and say, my kid did this, this, and this today. And the kid says, I didn't do any of that. Uh-huh. And we have the coaches go, you know, we have no idea what happened. Right. Right? So... We, we just we don't trust it up front until we have evidence that okay the, the analysis is correct mm-hmm. and then we say okay parent please go look for these things because your eyes are spot on you mm-hmm. understand that's why I think it's important later on for parents to watch a few lessons to understand what the player is working on right but ultimately a video is okay. going to be the best okay um, and then as analytics come along you'll be able to give us analytics of the match mm-hmm. I'm going to put a caveat on that. Okay. Analytics are awesome. We love them as coaches. Paul Anacone taught me something. He said, the stat said Andy Murray served 60% in a match. Mm-hmm. What they didn't say was he served 80% on the first two points of the game, which means he only served 60%, which was okay, but he served incredible to get the lead. Uh-huh. So then he could go for bigger serves later in the game because he already had the lead. Right. But the stats didn't tell him that. It just said he served 60%. Right. So statistics are like bikinis, and what they reveal is suggestive, and what they conceal is vital. Let's yeah. go with that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I think that's a Woody Allen line. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I love that line. Okay. Okay, so, so you want us to, us meaning parents, to first demonstrate to you that we understand what we're saying and what we're communicating back to you. If we don't, then that communication is really irrelevant. It it doesn't help us, but what what our job is as coaches, and this goes back to the original conversation, our job as coaches is to educate you as much as possible as to what to look for. Uh But again, I, I don't... I think it's an interesting relationship between parents and coaches because you would never go to an attorney right. and say, um, here's what I saw in this legal case and that's the information you should be working with. Yeah. Or doctor, here's the information right. that I know about my disease, I got it off Wikipedia and I need you to follow it. Yeah. You kind of trust them. Right. And that's navigating that relationship with the coach. Do you trust the coach? And does the coach trust you to say, here's the three things I want you to concentrate on where you're not going to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. I want to know how many balls went wide. I want to know the first service percentage. Mm -hmm. And I want to know, was the kid's attitude good on big points or pattern good on big points, whatever. Mm -hmm. Right? Those are things you can get right all the time. Yeah. As opposed to, tell me about the match and what you see. Right. It's such a vague, open question that it lends itself to so much interpretation that you're probably going to get a lot wrong. But I would wager that there aren't a lot of coaches that give that specific charge to a parent before a tournament right and and again I mean you know yes it would be awesome to be able to pay you to go to every single tournament match but that's just not the reality for most of us and until that is the reality we are your eyes and ears alongside of our child right and and I I think that's one of the hardest things about our sport is that the in every other sport the coach is there at the competition every time guiding right we don't have that well let me let me throw a different approach at it okay for you and and the parents listening Um, if the coach has done their job properly Mm -hmm. the wins and losses in the tournament really aren't what we're about we're about development okay yeah so what I'd like to know from you is Lisa this thing is called the inside out forehand pattern 
this is the position on the court where it happens. Okay. Can you watch the match this weekend and tell me how often your kid was there? Okay. I'll know a lot about that match if you just tell me how 60% of the time, 20% of the time, 80% of the time. Mm-hmm. I'll know a lot about what's going on in my player's development. If we're working on inside-out forehand position and dominating from that part of the court and you come back and tell me he only got there five times in a match. Right. You don't need a lot. You don't need to have, have this wealth of knowledge about the game mm-hmm. if I give you one little detail to look at because I'm concerned about development. Yeah. And you'll notice in all the questions I've asked you just now, I never said, did the kid win or lose? Right. Right? Right. I just want to know, is he following the developmental process that we're on? He could win national titles. She could lose five tournaments in a row. As long as we're on that developmental path and I have that vision toward the end, mm-hmm. that's what I'm concerned with. And... So, I won't say I don't need your feedback and I don't need to see the matches. I will say that a couple little details kind of give me all the information I need. Okay. And we, as coaches, also do some secret things just so you parents know. (laughs) Um, We will talk to other coaches Mm -hmm. about what they saw when they watched our player. Okay. And find out what happened at the match. Okay. Because we want your perspective, the player's perspective, and then we'll hear from the outside somebody who really watched it with a coach's eye. Yeah. And we get that a lot. That's awesome. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, like I said. I've been around the game a long time and I didn't know that. Well, we don't want you knowing that other coaches are watching your players. Okay, well, guess what? The secret's out now. <laughs> now we know. <laughs> you heard it first here, parents. <laughs> what else? We, I mean, we've been talking a long time I, and I'm... I've missed you. I've missed uh, having these conversations. And, you know. I'm Lisa bumped into me uh, on center court at Indian Wells. We were watching uh, Escobedo and Tiafo in a great match. Yeah. Uh, and, and just seeing the future of the game. I mean, these two young guys absolutely ripping the ball. Uh, it looks a lot different than the game did about 15 years ago. For sure. And I think it really displayed the athleticism and power that's going to be required in the future. And so I would tell parents that one of the. I'll give you two two things that I think would really help player development. Okay. Number one, take your kid to a college match Mm -hmm. so they understand that down the road sometime that might be really fun. Mm -hmm. These college matches are really fun to watch. Uh, And the second thing is let them watch a professional match live because the energy of the crowd, the sound of the ball, the squeaking of the shoes, the... Uh, 13 people on the court with umpires and lines people and ball kids running around and the heroic journey coming out of the tunnel and the crowd screaming there's so many little rich details that you can't capture watching it on TV Mm -hmm. that make that kid really understand what the competitive experience is about and losing a tournament here and there when they're young but understanding that they're keeping that goal in the future and going oh but I want to get to that place Mm -hmm probably be really good for their long-term development because they have a, a picture of what it's supposed to look like. And I will tell you, I, at that match the other day with Francis and Ernesto, I was sitting next to Ernesto's mom, yeah. and it does not get any easier <laughs> watching your kid play tennis. She had no fingernails left. <laughs> I mean, and she was awesome. She she maintained her composure, but the second he won that match, she let loose, and it was awesome. So It was very cool to see the whole box was so enthused, and um, they are. They're the future of the game. Right. There's a couple other young females here are unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, and so we're seeing kind of the... Who are you Amer- watching? Who are you excited about? Uh, Amanda Anasimova. Oh, my gosh. Uh, she's she's, she's already amazing. Look, looks like a top 10 player already. Yeah. Her, she's so professional, so composed, plays the game beautifully, has an absolute commit- commitment to playing an aggressive game. Mm-hmm. And no matter what the score is, we'll not back off of that. Yeah. Um, she's She looks like a, a young professional. Yeah. yeah. Very impressed with her. Yeah. She's got a great future. She won the U.S. Open Juniors in 2017, for those of you not familiar with her. Yeah. And she's, she's a 16-year-old in the third round of Indian Wells after qualifying, so she She's beat four top 200 players already, and I think uh, took out the 23 seed yesterday. Unreal. So yeah. it's, it's been a lot of fun, and, and I think, again, even for you and I, we're, we've been in the game forever, right? and it's still a blast to come out here and just watch and listen to the crowd and be part of the entire event. Absolutely. So, yeah. Well, thanks for chatting with us. Of course. It's so good to see you again. <laughs> I hope it's not another however long it's been. I feel like it's been like three years since I've talked to yeah, you. Yeah, it's or been a long like time. Other than Facebook messages. But that's the way the world communicates. That's today, right. So. All right. Well, thank you, Lisa. Thank you. And to my audience, thanks so much for tuning in. We'll catch you next time on Parenting Aces. 
I'm Lisa Stone, and you've been listening to the Parenting Aces podcast. For tennis parents, by a tennis parent. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe to us and write a review on iTunes. For more information on navigating the junior and college tennis journey, please visit us online at parentingaces.com. Thanks for tuning in and sharing us with your tennis community.